All right, Lord, it's time for the lesson. Didn't Mariah blow that song out? That was, that was incredible, sis. Thank you so much. And it's incredible to see the hearts of, of everyone uh, towards special missions and supporting our brothers and sisters around the world. It's such an incredible, incredible thing. You know, the Bible said that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. What was the joy set before him? Well, I personally, uh, um, I personally believe that there were two things that were Jesus' joy. Come on. I think the first was his dream of his kingdom being built and evangelizing the nations. I think we see that as that was the last thing he taught for 40 days before yeah. sending down. And yet, Jesus is just a little more personal than a dream for everybody. Wow. I also believe that Jesus has a specific dream, and the joy set before him was also you and your life. Yeah, man. And what he would do through you. Come on. Right. You are more powerful than you could ever know. Come on, Mark. You truly are. And yet there's not very much of a response to hearing that. Yeah. <laughs> Because you've got to be convinced to really understand and believe yeah, that truth. That's good one. There are 8 billion people on the planet. Mm -hmm. Come on. And I want you to consider, you remember when you were in school and they'd break up into teams for kickball or different sports? And you'd have like the, you always have one kid who was like the last one waiting to be picked. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> I was always the shortest, most scrawny kid in the class. So my my day started off like being one of those last kids to be picked. Come on, bro. And I endeavored myself to not be that one, to be the first guy picked. Okay. And uh, it's so funny, you know, the first one to be picked is all fired up. Like, yeah, that's right. Come on, we're gonna get him. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Why? Because. He was just convinced of who he was. Yeah. Wow. She was just convinced of who she was. Yeah. And, and yet, this morning I want to convince you of who you are. All right. Come on, bro. Out of 8 billion people on the planet, God chose little old you Come on. to be one of the first to know his truth. Wow. Come on. Wow. See, then God picked his team, and he said, out of all 8 billion people, who am I going to use? to be the foundation of getting my word around the world. That's you this morning. Come on. Now you can either be encouraged by that, or you can feel a lot of pressure. Amen. Wow. <laughs> Come on, bro. Come on. What an honor. Yeah. What an honor to be called to fish for the souls of other men. Yeah. See, I believe that Jesus believes in you in a way you can't fathom. See, He created you to be a fisher of men. Amen. He created you to be fruitful. That His Spirit would emanate from you. Thus drawing others to you. So you can tell them how you got that Spirit. Amen. He made you to be able to overcome any and every sin that you might do in your life. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And not just overcome it, but escape the destruction that comes from the sin. Come on. Yeah. He created you to be at peace with all mankind. Come on. Amen. 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 He created for you the perfect friends yeah. that are with you right here now today. Yeah, they're not really perfect. <laughs> Ask God if they're perfect. Ask God how He views your friend. And He would say, You're the picture of absolute perfection. Because Jesus' is Son atoned for every wrongdoing and every flaw. In our region here, in the, the LA Church, in the Southland region here, we've got uh, about 60 of you who are single. 
And yet, you know, I'm just not convinced that each of you realizes that God has already picked for you the perfect spouse. As I survey the region, I see no one with the gift that Paul had to be alone. Nope. That's okay. And yet, you don't remember I yet. Know some of you really lack faith that God has the perfect person there for you. Come on, bro. Talk about it. Oh, but it's Jesus' dream, so it's the best life ever. So, of course, he's got the perfect spouse. Come on. Come on. Give me a The other aspect of his dream for you is that you would fulfill your role in his kingdom. Amen. Come on, bro. See, this isn't like the little kickball team okay. where you where you ride the bench all the time because you're the last one there. Oh. You have a role. And he's prepared you for it your entire life. Come on. Today I hope you grasp how special Come on. you are. Come on, right, 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 right. And how special our church is. Yeah. It's great to be back in DC. Come on. Oh yeah! Yeah, God always picks the times and places, and uh, Tracy had not seen the Martin Luther King Memorial. So I took her to go see it, and uh, we took pictures by it, and, and then uh, we got done, and that was great. It was awesome. It was inspired. And uh, there's, there's just these walls that have sayings of his all throughout his lifetime. I think it's going to be the most impacting quotes. And I said, well, let's go take some pictures in front of the White House. Tracy's like, man. Nah. I'm sure you really want to be tired. Can we please do it for me? All right. Um. And then, of course, you can't find parking by the White House. And, uh, and so... Uh, I said, all right, well, let's, uh, let, let's just go into one of the parking structures. It'll cost a little bit, but, you know, hey, anyway, let's get this special time together. So we did that, and we went, and we, you know, we uh, got our picture, took our selfie in front of the White House. All right. yeah. see. <laughs> and, uh, and that was great. And then let's go around the back, right, the waterfall. Let's go take some pictures there. So we walked around the White House, and uh, as we got to the path where you walk across, the, uh, where you're right in front of the, the house, uh, all of a sudden, this huge entourage starts coming in. Yeah. And it's all the black SUVs uh -oh. and the presidential limo. Uh -oh. and, and then the ambulance goes through. Uh -oh. At first, I was like, something happened to Trump. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody shoot that man already? Uh -oh. <laughs> and I, mean, I don't want that to happen anyway. <laughs> but, um, but then the Secret Service agents came out. And... Uh, they're telling people to get back. So this is the path that you're supposed to walk down. And they're telling everybody to get off the path. And so they heard us all down. And we had to walk around and then almost to the Washington Monument before they let us get back in the grass. Uh, and, and then we heard it's because he had just landed at Andrews Air Force Base and, was, and the helicopter was going to bring him in. Yeah. Now, how many times can you go to the White House and be right there when the president of the helicopter, when Marine One comes in? Whoa. And so, uh, and so we waited. And we got to see that, that they're closing all the streets in the city around us. Wow, that's crazy. And we couldn't leave if we wanted to. Yeah. yeah. And so, and then the helicopters come, and his helicopters keep circling. Come on. And you can see the camera out of the side of the helicopter filming everybody. You know, they're doing the facial recognition, wow. making sure everybody's safe. Wow. And, uh, and, and then the, the whole place is just shut down. Wow. And everybody's just waiting. And then all of a sudden you hear... <laughs> And he, and he came and he flew like right next to the Washington Monument. Wow. It was just awesome. Mm -hmm. And he flew right over our head. And then we watched him like, man, this is so cool. And then it just kept flying. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the decoy. Oh. <laughs> like, dang, he fooled us. And so then he came on in and he landed. And what a special experience, you know. God just picked the exact time and place to encourage our souls with that. That's that was so awesome. Good. So you were in the White House within the first time today? And so... And so God, you know, he tries to encourage us. It's an incredible thing. Yeah. Uh, today I want you to be encouraged. It's no mistake you're here today. Come on. Yeah. It's no mistake that uh, that you're here in this time today. 
Uh, turn your Bible to 1 John chapter 2. Oh, yes. We've been studying the book of 1 John. And uh, the last lesson was done by our very own Kristen George. Teaching us the, the war that we're waging. Being a part of God's kingdom. And our next study will be on chapter 3. But today I want to give us kind of a character study to help us. Wow. And in 1 John 2, verse 18, the Bible says, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. You know, that can be a little confusing. I don't know about you, but when I first heard the word Antichrist, I thought about somebody that was like really good looking and really powerful on earth coming out that they were Jesus. Right, come on. You know, and that Satan himself would come down and parade and masquerade as, as if he was the Messiah. Yeah, come on. But then it says there's many Antichrists. Come on, brother. And I went, oh, that's pretty interesting. Okay. And he says here, lost my place there. Many antichrists have come. And he says, this is how we know it is the last hour. Wow. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. Wow. So the antichrist is those who come in the church and deny Jesus' way of doing things and leave the church. Yeah. It says, for if they had belonged to us, if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belong to us. Right. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. <clears throat> he says, who's the liar? It is the man that denies that Jesus is the Christ. Mm -hmm. Such a man is the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. So any man can be the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. He says, he denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. <clears throat> Not everybody makes it that gets baptized. Yeah. That, you know what? That's a hard thing for us. Yeah. yeah, come on, bro. Come on, bro. It's hard for us to handle the, the separation of a great relationship that we feel. It produces a lot of feelings, doubts. And yet, I want to talk about what it means to deny Jesus right. so that we can understand the chapters to come. Come on, bro. Because it's not just walking away from God. Yeah. Denying Jesus is something each one of us does every day. Oh, yeah. You and me not being Jesus have sinned. Yeah. Yeah. And every day, there's one or more choices that we make that go against what Jesus did. Yeah. Come on, bro. And when we do that, we deny the Christ. Yeah. Now, I don't want us to get scared by that. Uh, I want us to understand what it does to us. Yeah. So that we can have better lives here on earth. Amen. The difference between pride and humility. Yeah. Come on, talk about it. See, when there's change or when there's transition, people who have a lot of pride in them really struggle with change. It takes pride to deny Jesus' way of doing so. Come on. Consider those you know who have walked away. Has life gotten any better for any of them? Sometimes they send angry texts about how they were hurt. Most all go back to not just their old sins, but worse. Yeah. Come on, bro. Come on, talk about it. And yet, I want to ask you a question this morning. Can anyone lead you? Can anyone lead you spiritually? See, the Bible says that all believers are competent to instruct each other. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible also says for there to not be favoritism. Yeah. I want to guard us from becoming a church of favoritism. Wow. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on. The title of today's lesson is Humility Can Get You Through Anything. Yeah. Okay. You know, we went to D.C. and, and uh, 
it was an incredible time. It was our first time back in the D.C. church since we lived there for three years. And it's been two years since we were there. It was so encouraging to see that in that transition, how few people were lost. Most of the church is still there. And, uh, and of course, some have been sent out different places and whatnot. But, but it, it's, a, it's encouraging to see people stay there. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and, and of course, they, you know, the whole thing of being a father in the faith, everyone's so honoring, respectful, and kind with their words. Um, and yet, it was interesting. It was a, a, a myriad of feelings that I experienced when we were there. Wow. The honor of being a father in the faith, but also it wasn't home. Yeah. Of course it's the family. But it wasn't home. Because I found myself feeling honored by my brothers and sisters that I led there, but missing all of you. Wow. 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 This is home. Yes. This is where God put me. Yes. And it's so great to, to feel that and embrace that. Come on, bro. Come on. Um, I want us to learn from Jesus today. Come on. Turn to Matthew chapter 11. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. In order to have the power to, do not, to not deny Jesus and his way of doing things, Amen. I believe we have to learn about pride and humility. Yeah. Oh, bro. The world speaks of humility as a bad thing. And, and you know, one thing that I've learned being here in the Southland region, I, as I get to know each of you and we trade stories and share what God's done in our lives and our, and our past. Most of you have endured some of the most horrific things I've ever heard. It's just terrible. And yet, you're here. Fighting. Yeah. To not just make it and survive, but to change things so others don't hurt them. says humility is burdensome and doesn't work. In Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Yeah. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Yeah. Amen. You know when Jesus says. There's a particular way you handle a relationship. Or, or something that happens to you. It seems so hard to do it his way. Right. Like if someone slapped you across the street. Turn the other. You're like, Are you kidding me? <laughs> Yeah. And, and yet, we say somebody wrongs you, forgive from the heart, like God forgave you. Yeah. 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 And that just seems impossible sometimes. Right. And yet, if you do it, your burden is gone. Yeah. Think about all that Jesus endured. And see if you've suffered more. Wow. Come on, bro. I don't think there's any of us that have even come remotely close to suffering. Come on, bro. Come on. Like Jesus suffered. Yeah. Physically or emotionally. So we should learn from him. Yeah. We should learn from him to have that gentle and humble heart. Because pride and humility are a centerpiece of our relationships with each other. It needs to be the theme in our times where we help one another be obedient to the Word of God and disciple. Uh, turn to Philippians chapter 2. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. As we read the Scripture, I'd like you to really consider... Am I living this out? Not do I just read, have I read it before, or do I understand it, but is this who I am becoming more like day after day? Now we're going to read Philippians 2, 
verses 2 through 11. I'm going to read from the message version. Because I believe it captures the heart in a profoundly powerful way. He says, if you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if His love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front or sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forgive yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourself the way that Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God but didn't think so much of himself that he came to that he had to cling to the advantages of that status. No matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave. He became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. The worst kind of death of that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever. So that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before him. Wow. Wow. And call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. What a powerful What a life-altering passage if we put this into practice. You know what I'm saying? Amen. See, humility cannot just be something that you have or add to your life. It must become who you are. Come on. See, we don't do it because we think of humility as being less powerful. All these atrocious things that you've endured in your lifetime have told you don't be humble. Come on, bro. Yeah. Yeah. If you're humble, they're going to take advantage of you. They're going to get me again. Well, I want you to just consider this. The most powerful man to ever walk the planet was also the most impacting man because he completed his power with humility. Yeah, sure did. Come on. Come on. I mean, you got Jesus himself telling you, learn from me today. Right? Come on. I mean, look around the room here. We are so blessed. Yeah. We're so blessed to be in each other's presence. Yeah. <laughs> and yet, each person you look at is a sinner yeah. and has sinned yeah. and eventually will hurt you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we are supposed to learn from Jesus the proper response when somebody hurts. Come on, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Verse 10 of that passage was amazing. Jesus' humility made it possible for you to have salvation. <laughs> humility changes you. It really does. It causes you to get open with your life. But not just get open. But it causes you to not gauge like who I should be open with and who I shouldn't. Come on, come on, come on, bro. It causes you to recognize, just like God picked the time and place that we were there to see the helicopter go there, that the person in your life, that's the time and place to be open with that person. Amen. 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 Humility causes you to realize that you have no right to cop an attitude. Come on. Come on, come on bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. 
Humility causes you to talk about your temptations before they become your sins. Yes. Talk about it, brother. Talk about it, brother. Come on. We got a confusion there about the whole confession thing because I hear people all the time talking about, I'm confessing my temptations. <laughs> There's no confession needed if it hasn't been sinned. <laughs> You're starting your heart when you talk about your temptations. So you don't have to talk about those sins. Come on. That's good, bro. Humility is the only thing that causes you to be selfless. There's no other, there's not, you cannot be selfless and prideful at the same time. It's a spiritual impossibility. You can appear selfless without humility, but you cannot be selfless without. Now, pride, on the other hand, pride's a very different animal. Because pride doesn't change you at all. Pride just lets you be who you are as long as you want to be that. Pride feels good in the moment. See, pride feels good until you're completely alienated because of all that you've done in pride. When you feel all alone. And then it's not any fun anymore. Talk about it. Talk about that part. And then at that point, if you get to that point, then you can choose to get humble and realize you've isolated yourself. Yeah. Or you can just get more prideful and blame everybody else while you feel angry. Yeah. Yeah. Pride is what causes you to look down on others. Yes. Pride is actually what causes favoritism. Yes. I like I like that person more than this one. Yes. Pride makes you think the grass is greener everywhere but where you're at. <laughs> See, pride is what causes you to defend yourself. Yes. Isn't it crazy how we sin and we know we've sinned? But we still defend ourselves? Right. <laughs> Isn't that the craziest thing? Yeah. <laughs> if you've been hurt like super deeply, this is a huge one for you. Yeah. Because a sinful response to being sinned against is to sin again. Yeah. A sinful response will never bring a unity. Right. Wow. And it, it, it's huge in the in those in the culture for those who've been abused, physically, emotionally, suffered. Is that is a sinful response is okay, and because it's understandable. Right. And so you defend a sinful response. See, sin is pride is what causes you to make excuses. It's what causes you to get uncommitted. It's, pride is what makes you take extra time to make yourself look good and then show up like It's the thing that lets us dishonor God with not singing with all of our heart or to not give to Him what we should and feel like we're great. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, bro. Pride is what lets us walk through the door and bring all of us and all of our problems with us. Yeah. And not honor God's house. Yeah. Come on. See, pride is what makes you sit there when somebody's giving an example and you go, oh, I know he's going to talk about it. Ooh. <laughs> you didn't say my name. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> but see, here's the thing. <laughs> Pride slowly but surely transforms your heart and your mind and soul to operate like Satan, not like Jesus. Yeah, that's, true. that's why God hates pride. Yeah. That makes sense. And yet he lifts up the humble. See, a trust issue is a pride issue. Yeah. <laughs> It is the sinful response to being hurt. You know, I'm just, I'm just scared. No, you have a prideful response to unknown. I'm just confused. Well, the Bible makes out things very clear, so how can you be confused? 
Now, here's the thing about the, the Bible calls you and I, right, to be how humble? Completely, completely humble. Wow, that's so hard. <laughs> I went to the doctor this week, and uh, have you ever gone to the doctor and you're telling the doctor exactly what's wrong with you because you know what's wrong with you right. and you know he doesn't think so? Right. And so I went to the doctor and I said, you know, uh, I'd, I'd like to start some testing for early onset of Alzheimer's. It's my, everyone in my family gets it, and uh, I literally like can't remember anything. It's crazy. <laughs> At home, I'm, Tracy's will vouch for you. At home, I like lose everything. I go and put on a pot of water, and I forget it's on. These are all things that have been very uncharacteristic of my life. And so I just know I'm going to go. That's what's happening with me. And I go to the doctor, and uh, and I tell him that, and all these things, and he says, uh, "How much sleep do you get?" And, I, and it's funny. I did what we do in our discipling times. I go, well, I'm getting a whole lot more sleep than I did like the last 20 years. Right. <laughs> right. 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 And, and being a great discipler, my doctor said, that's not what I asked you. Right. Right. He says, so since you brought it up, I'll, not only tell me how much sleep are you getting, how much were you getting before? Since you think you're in a better place. Right. <laughs> I said, I'm getting about six hours a night, is what I'm getting. And uh, he's like, oh my gosh, how much did you get before? <laughs> about three hours or so, typically. He's like, you, you don't have a whole life. Awesome. You don't have a life. You need some sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, you just need to sleep. <laughs> and, that, and then came up that I have sleep apnea. So, yeah. And of course, you know, I'm like full of excuses. He's like, so you use a CPAP machine? Nope. No. <laughs> Tried it, didn't work. <laughs> Okay, um, so surgery. Yeah, I tried that one too. That didn't work. I've had surgery twice. Okay. And so, he, he's, you know, he gives me a few solutions. And uh, he says, you know, you should try some of this stuff for snoring as well. Yeah. And I was like, all right. So, you know, and now, because I don't sleep, I also don't dream. And there's an incredible thing that happens in your mind when you dream. Uh, your mind is like compartmentalizing your memories and choosing which ones to get rid of and which ones to keep, right? Really? And so that's why your dreams are crazy. But I never remember mine, so I don't experience that. Right. Uh, the sleep test showed I wake up about once every 60 seconds. And I, I go into that lucid state between being awake and asleep yeah. about once a minute. So imagine how many dreams I actually have. I wake up more tired than I start. Right. Yeah. right. And my mind's not compartmentalizing and putting things out, so it's just overloaded with things that you shouldn't even remember. Right. And so, uh, and so I said, all right. So I went to I went to the store, and I'm looking through all the snoring things. Uh, that's lame. That was lame. Uh, so finally, I said, fine. I'm just gonna get these little strips. So they make these little plastic strip things that are straight and they have adhesive. They put them on your nose. I was like, all right, this is lame, but I'll do it. <laughs> so the last two nights I've used it, I've slept better than I've slept in ages. <laughs> and yet, the last two nights I had dreams, and I remember what they are. And I wake up resting. And I was like... <laughs> How long have those strips been out? <laughs> I was like, I tried Sudafed, I tried Afrin spray. That's terrible, especially because you can't keep using it. When you stop, it's like worse than ever. What's my point? There's easy solutions in our lives. Yeah. We just blow them off. Yeah. In our pride, we blow them off. And usually, it's in the church, we get advice from people. And they show us scriptures, and they counsel us, and then we just blow it off. Yeah. So for years, I've been suffering because I just blew off a little plastic strip. You know, how stupid was that? <laughs> I'm sure Jesus is just kind of really stupid. Turn to, turn to uh, 
Romans chapter 15. A couple of brief points here. The first is humility builds godly relationships. Humility builds godly relationships. When people give you advice and you constantly blow them off, what you got to consider what you're doing in the relationship. Yeah. What you're doing to it. Oh, man. Romans 15, in verse 14. Come on, Rod. I don't get there. Romans 15, verse 14. I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. Can anyone mention? Yeah. Yeah. Right here, we, we have the qualification of what it takes to lead you. Be baptized. Have the Holy Spirit living inside you. And be willing to show you the truth. That's it. But we play favoritism. I want an older Christian. Oh. 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 I don't trust the younger Christian. I want the older Christian. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. The biggest one comes in the marriage group. I want somebody who has had kids and knows what it's like to raise kids, or else they can't really help. So, now, then you gotta go, where is that? Where, is that? where in the Bible did that come from? Come on, bro. Right? I haven't found it yet. Yeah. I've been reading for 24 years and I haven't found it yet. What I have found is Timothy was one of the greatest leaders yeah. in the New Testament. Right. And he didn't have any kids. Yeah. And he was young. That's why, he had, that's why in 2 Timothy at the end, Paul had to really help him because the older people kept beating him up the whole time and wouldn't respect him. Oh, come on. See, the, see, Understanding, and then that's where, that's where the favoritism comes. Right? I mean, most of the guys that we read about didn't have kids. Come on. The apostles were teenagers. Like, can you imagine the teenagers started the church wow. and ran the church Woo! and evangelized the world in that church? people leading us because they're wow. so full of vigor and faith that it seems stupid but no, their ideas. No. Right. Come on. That's no work. And you know what finally hit me? I was like, what seems stupid is trusting someone who lived like I lived as a non-Christian. Oh yeah. Trusting me with the salvation of the world. Wow. Wow. Trusting you to help all. Like, if somebody watched your life as a non-Christian, they say, trust that guy to change the world. <laughs> yeah, Jesus did. Yeah. So if Jesus chose you, then I choose you. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. And I just think we've got to be a whole lot more humble with each other. Yeah. Isn't it funny how like, some, nothing will be going right in a person's life and everybody's trying to give them advice, and they know exactly why every piece of advice given to them is not wrong, is not right, or is not going to work. It's pride. Come on, Ron. Where do we get that from? We get it from the world. The world is such a wicked place. Come on. I'll never, I'll never forget this event that I saw on TV. Where I saw Tiger Woods. Oh. And Tiger Woods got up. He had more endorsement deals than any athlete ever before. Right. I mean, this guy's a great. And then he goes and he glows it in his personal life. Yeah. Now, is he accountable to you for what he does in his life? No. You don't know the man, right? No. I don't know. I'm not. He's not accountable to me. But yet he got up on TV, on national TV, in tears, apologizing that he was a doctor. I mean, you talk about some guts. Yeah. He didn't blame anybody. He didn't point the finger at anybody. He didn't say my wife didn't take care of me or this or that. He just took over. Yeah. In tears. You'd think it. Everybody would be nice to him. 
The next day, a poll went out. Do you forgive Tiger? 51% of people said, no, I don't. Wow. That's the world we live in. Yeah. Where you can come and just apologize profusely and be completely humble. You know, I don't believe it. Yeah. No, I won't buy anything that you endorse. But we do that, right? You hurt me, so I want a different leader. I want to go to a different church, or I want to go to a different ministry. Where are you And yet, when we do that, when we do that, we destroy our relationships with those yeah. individuals. You know, not forgiving is tired. Yeah. Let me tell you, I've been tired for many years, not being able to breathe right. And yet, pride makes does that to your life. How many years are you going to go without breaks Come on, come on, Ryan. How many years are you going to go not rested? Yeah. See, Jesus has come to me. Yeah. Do it my way, and you'll find rest for your soul. Yeah. We need to be those deep-spirited friends yeah. whose on, interactions are guided by the Word of God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 Secondly, come on, humility affects. The way you see and how you respond to authority. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. The purpose of authority in God's church is to bring unity. See, in the world, authority is to make money. Authority is do what I say so we can all make a bunch of money together. That's the business world. Right. And, and yet, the purpose of it in God's kingdom is to bring unity. Yeah. Most of us don't really understand authority. We just know we don't like it. Yeah. And when we sit in that place, we go, I'm free in Christ! You can't tell me what to do. Come on, bro. You can't make me. You know, I, I can't I can't go to your house and open up your Bible and put it before you and stick a gun to your head and tell you to read your Bible. You're right, I can't make it. Wow. But yet we all know that we should do that. Yeah. yeah. But we blow it off. Right? You can always see when we when we're blowing it off because we stop being evangelistic. Mm -hmm. We stop caring about those who went out from us to the mission people. Come on. And we can only think about our own individual little lives. Yeah. And, and, and that's pride. Yeah. That's pride. But a wrong view of authority causes us to disobey the scriptures when we're given instruction how to restore unity in the situation. Let me ask you, who has authority in your life? Who is it that has authority in your life right now? Or are you just doing you? Mm -hmm. I, I there's a place for men or women over us to have authority in our lives to bring unity. Yeah. Not to tell us what to do. Yeah. See, the thing about authority is we, we don't really understand the different models of authority that exist and when they are applicable. Right? Right. There's two types of authority. There's a linear authority. And there's a family model of authority. The linear is like the chain of command. It's more militaristic in style. Right. And yet it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. We love the story of Jericho, how the walls fell down. But consider how that happened. you got the most fortified city in the world, right? It's just walls. Just, just massive walls. And lined all the way across the top are archers. And you know, they, you know they cleared the trees out some distance away so they can clearly see anybody that's approaching. And so the archers are just up there picking people off. It's a great plan. Now, consider what Joshua, the young leader, yes. consider his plan. Okay, here's what we're going to do, guys. All of us are going to march around the city for six days. Oh, back by the trees? No, no, out in the open. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to walk around. 
Yeah. Just have a good time. Just have a good time fellowship. Yeah. Walk around. Six days. Right. How's that a great point, though? Wow. Let's get that arrow, dude. They're kicking people off. But they did it. Then he goes, okay, seventh day, we're going we're gonna to up our game the seventh day. We're at war, so we're going to take this city. So we're going to up our game the seventh day. You're not just going to march. You're going to march, and then you're going to blow the trumpets for God. Right? Are you kidding me? So we're going to march around the city, then we're going to blow the trumpets so they know exactly where I'm standing? Yeah. Oh, trust me, it's going to work. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Come on. Like, this was the kind of plans they had in the Bible, right? Come on. <laughs> Jesus, you know, hey, Peter, just get on out of the boat. It'll be okay, dude. Yeah. No, you're not going to sink. Come on. Come on. Come on. Just one. <laughs> like, these plans are crazy. Dude. Yeah. Wow. You look at every battle plan of every battle in the Bible, it was an insane plan. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what about Gideon? I mean, Gideon started out like, I'm the least of Manasseh, I'm not worthy. He, he took like forever to trust God when he said, hey, you're, you're a mighty warrior. Yeah. I'm calling you. In his pride, he, we, we praise him for the test of, of the fleece. And yet, he shouldn't have needed the fleece. He should have trusted right off the bat because God said so. In his pride, he put out the fleece. Now, thank God the fleece let him get rid of his pride. Mm. But then consider his battle. Wow. He's got 10,000 men. <laughs> God says, all right. You, you got a lot of resources at your disposal here, man. I know that you're fighting 2 million people, but um, here's what we're going to do. Wow. We're just going to like take a few people away. Right? We're just going to move them elsewhere. They're not needed here. Come on. So, he weeded 10,000 down to 300. <laughs> what? <laughs> great plan. Sometimes we have people move in and out of our lives, and we're like, oh, great plan. Now our Bible talk sucks. Oh. Oh. You know, we act like somebody's taking something from us. No, God's trying to provide an opportunity for you to see a miracle happen. Yeah. You just keep fighting. We've got to understand that linear authority that, that, that makes crazy plans. Yeah. We also have to understand the family authority. So all of us kind of lend toward one or the other, either the more militaristic style. Like we, all, we all know Jermaine does that style. Right? Yeah. 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 But, then, but then, then there's also the family-oriented style. Come on, Rico, come on. The father, mother, big brother, big sister style. See, everyone understands the husband, the dad, has final authority in the house, right? Yeah. Amen. Now, God forbid a man just, just bark orders all the time. Amen. And be a militaristic husband. Amen. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and yet, here's what happens. Okay, so when, when dad leaves, all this authority goes, then who has authority? Mom. See, even when dad's there, mom has authority. But when he leaves, mom has all authority. Right? I'll never forget the first time I ever said no to my mom. It was also the last. This is, you know, you have those memories that are just so vivid in your mind. Right. And so I was five years old. Uh -oh. One of the only things I can remember from being five years old, right? Come on, dude. And I was I'm at the stove, right? And I'm standing on my on my stool and I'm cooking French toast. Uh -oh. okay. And you know how when you do something for somebody you feel a little entitled? So I'm cooking French toast for me and my mom. Uh -oh. And I'm up there cooking and she says, take the trash out. And I was like, Right. <laughs> I just blew her off. And then you know that voice, right? Uh -huh. Ronnie! I said take the trash out. <laughs> and I turned and I said, I'm cooking French toast. No. <laughs> and, then, and then the movie turned totally slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, you can see something out of the corner of your eye? I said no, and I turned, but I just saw something out of the corner of my eye. And I remember I turned and... You don't know what you're asking. <laughs> no. Right. Lord, no. 
can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Amen. And I imagine it was a very quick answer. Oh, yes, we can. Right. <laughs> Could they? No one. No. no. Ah, they could and they did. They could and they did. Were they ready in that moment? No. Not at all. In that moment, they were not. But they did. They eventually drank the cup. Yeah. They were baptized the baptism Jesus did of being a martyr. <coughs> we can't underestimate our young people and how powerful they are. Amen. Come on. What they're going to do, what God is going to do through them. I mean, I look at our team ministry over here. And... Better raise up fast because we're getting old. <laughs> getting old. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I baptize with. But the sit at my right or left is not for me to drink. These are these places belong to those for whom they've been prepared. It says when the ten heard this, they were angry. <laughs> it's funny. Why were they angry? We'll talk about that. And they became indignant with James and John. So Jesus called them together, and he said, "You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them." Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be last. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom wow. for many. That's the man you fall. I love this interaction because here are these selfishly ambitious guys come to him. And they just want glory for themselves. And Jesus, like, you have no idea what you're asking. No, 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 we do, we do, we do. Oh, yeah, you're going to find out. <laughs> you are going to find out. And then, all, and then it just goes, when the ten heard about this, there's a little piece missing right there. So they're talking with just them and Jesus, and then all of a sudden the ten find out. How did the ten find out? Have you ever had somebody tell you something and you just kind of heard what you wanted to hear? Right? Right? This is what happened. I can just imagine. They're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you. And I can just, just see Jesus going, all right, here it comes. And they go, to Tim, guys, guys, check this out. We went to Jesus. And we wanted to find out like who's gonna be like the like in glory next to him. And guess what? It's us! Yes! It's us! The guys are like, you're so stupid. What's wrong with you? You think, oh, now, it's funny, why did this hand become indignant? Because they thought it was them. Come on. <laughs> right? And then Jesus is like, all right, guys. All right, hold the kids together. Everybody come over here. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Right or left doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's already prepared for somebody. And I'm not going to tell you that you are not. But you want to be great? See, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be great. In fact, you should endeavor to be as great as you could possibly be to make the most impact for Jesus. If you want to be great, so Jesus wants you to be great too because he tells them how to do it. He doesn't, he doesn't like get angry that they want to be great. So if you want to be great, go serve him. Amen. Go serve him. Amen. That's how you become great. You know, it takes humility to become great. Lastly, after you remember that humility affects the way you see authority, the way you respond to it, lastly, you've got to humble yourself before God does it for you. Wow. In Philippians 2, the Bible says that Jesus humbled himself. Hebrews 5 says Jesus humbled himself in obedience, even death on the cross. Turn to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. This is a very missed and not taught about subject of humbling yourself. Why do people not teach on humbling themselves? Because they don't 
humble themselves themselves. James chapter 4, in verse 6. This will be our last scripture. But he gives us more grace. Boy, that should define our relationships. Somebody wrongs you? A little more grace. Somebody else? A little more grace. How much do you need? I'm full of it. We are called to have a storehouse of grace that's so full that no one can make us separate ourselves. Yeah. You go, oh, that one was really bad. Grace. <laughs> Why? Because they deserve it? No. Or because they've changed? No, because God does it to you every day. Yeah. That's why. This is why Scripture says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. When you have pride, God, God just like puts a halt on the grace happening for your life. Yeah. He just halts it, holds you up. All doors kind of seem shut when you have pride. Mm -hmm. But those are humble. He gives more grace. Okay. All right. wow. Do you feel safe? Come on, bro. This morning. Yes. Yeah. It saddens me when I see people who are saved walk around not and then they don't feel safe. Come on. That's so sad. It's so sad to, to have the truth. Like, do you remember when the curtain just tore from top to bottom? Yeah. Right? And the rocks split, the earth shook. Yeah. See, the Holy Spirit had been confined to residing in the most holy of holies that day. Wow. Right? And that day, the curtain broke open, and the Spirit rushed out of the temple. And it's been, and your portion of it has been floating around for thousands of years. And then the day you got baptized, oh, it was like a laser. It came out of the water <laughs> right into you. Then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You double -minded. Man, we doubt so much that God's way is going to work. 1 Corinthians 6 talks about lawsuits among the believers. He says, why not rather be wrong? You can be wronged and not be hurt. Yeah. You just got to believe that this morning. Yeah, come on, bro. Come on, you, have the, you have the armor of God on? Yeah. Whoa. Come on, bro. I mean, if you're walking and you have the armor of God on, you have the Holy Spirit living inside you behind that armor? Yep. And, and you resign that your thoughts are that you can have the armor on, have the Holy Spirit, and somebody can still hurt you? There's something wrong with that. Yeah. It's time to shed ourselves of all this hurt. Shed ourselves of all that's happened in our past. And let the spirit that's inside us well up and fight. So that God will guide us in the right way. It says in verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Brothers, do not slander anyone. Yes. On, Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. Yes. Yeah, we, we, that kind of gets glossed over, the save and destroy part. Right? We, we, see, we, we get confused because we're made in the image of God, so we do understand our words create. Right? Initiative words that we speak and words that we say in response to something. Yeah. They create and they can destroy. Yeah. Yeah. But they can't hurt or destroy someone who has the armor of God. Yeah. Someone who understands who is, who's there. Yeah. Grasp the subtlety of the scripture. The subtlety of the scriptures 
is if you wait for God to humble you, whoo, then you're not going to get lifted up. It's just a hard road. Wow. Come on, bro. Amen. God has given us and God has given you great victories in your life already. Yeah. I think it's incumbent upon us to honor that. Amen. Amen. To not think you're powerful is to deny Jesus himself. Come on. Today we need to get close to one another. We've got to get the right perspective on the story. We've got to get be deep spirited friends. Yeah. Let's humble ourselves so God doesn't have to do it for us. Come on, bro. Remember this morning, humility can and will get you through heaven. I love you guys. Let's stand on up for one final song. Come on, bro. Come on.